Please welcome Tom Vilsack, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, it's uh, great to be here this morning. Appreciate the opportunity. I apologize for not being on stage when that announcement was made. I was saying hello to the uh, last panel. Uh, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to uh, sort of reconnect with uh, the beauty of upstate New York. Having gone to school in upstate New York at Hamilton College, I'd kind of forgotten uh, how great, great the fall time period is uh, in this neck of the woods. And it did give me a sense of uh, thinking about what happens every year, uh, that there's a change in season, uh, and the beauty and the impact of change. Uh, and I, I thought about that in the context of my conversation with you all today. Uh, you know, I had a meeting with my staff earlier this week, uh, and I have uh, a lot of uh, folks who work really hard, um, and a lot of folks who work in our communication shop and press shop who work very hard. And, uh, they asked for an opportunity to meet with me for a few minutes, and the purpose of the meeting was to discuss the New York Times event. <laughs> and it was something to the effect that, uh, Mr. Secretary, sir, you realize uh, this isn't going to be like most of the events that you go to. Uh, not everyone is going to necessarily agree with what you say, sir. Um, and um, <laughs> you, you may not just be, you know, they, they may not clap and they may not uh, pat you on the back like some of the events that you go to. Well, I was appreciative of that. Um, as a former mayor, state senator, and governor, I've been in situations where I've had to talk to folks uh, uh, about tough subjects. But I'm actually looking forward to this because I think I've got a story to tell about change. Uh, and I think it's a good story and a positive story. But I recognize that the story I'm about to tell is not necessarily the pace of change or the extent of change that some in the audience may want. Uh, but I hope that by the end of this conversation, there's at least an acknowledgement that we are headed in the right direction and we're, we're taking the positive steps and that there's still more to do. And so I've decided to break this up into three component parts. I want to talk briefly about the change that's occurred in nutrition uh, under this administration, uh, expanded access uh, to assistance and help, and healthier alternatives. I'd like to talk for a few minutes about sustainable agriculture and the work of this administration in supporting diversity uh, within agriculture, which I think is an important value and component of this uh, administration. Uh, and then I'd like to talk about local and regional food systems and the support that has uh, been undertaken by this administration to expand opportunity in that space and, and what it means in the long term. And then at the end of that, I'd be happy to respond to questions, recognizing that in these remarks, I'm probably not going to touch on every uh, hot button issue that you want me to talk about. So that's what we'll obviously do during the Q&A session. So first and foremost, nutrition. When the president-elect uh, Obama asked me to come to Chicago in December of, 19, of 2008 to discuss the possibility of me taking this job, I was surprised that the first set of instructions that he gave me after he offered me this job was to make sure that the children of this country were well fed. I took that directive very seriously, and I do because uh, my life started out in a Catholic orphanage. Uh, in Pittsburgh, and the one thing I know about myself, uh, without knowing what my family background was in fact, is that I was well fed at the orphanage. I know that because there's a picture of me when I was adopted, and I was fairly plump uh, at the time. <laughs> and I understood and dealt with, uh, and had continued to deal with, weight issues throughout my entire life, uh, and I know how difficult and devastating it can be uh, if you're dealing with self-image issues related to, uh, to uh, being overweight. I know what it's like to be made fun of, and I know what it's like to be bullied because of how you look. So when the president directed me to focus on better nutrition for children, it was something that I was happy to do. And over the course of the last six plus years, there has been a comprehensive, collaborated, and coordinated effort to try to improve nutrition assistance across the board. It started with uh, changing the WIC package 
uh, making sure that our women, infants, children program uh, provided access to the kinds of fruits and vegetables that wouldn't normally be purchased uh, or obtained by families uh, based on the data uh, to expand the, the scope uh, of tastes and interests that youngsters and, and uh, young moms uh, would have. Uh, it extended into our SNAP program, uh, first and foremost making sure that those who were eligible for SNAP and who needed SNAP uh, were given the opportunity to participate in SNAP. Uh, when I took office, 72% uh, of eligibles were receiving SNAP. Today it's 83%. Uh, and just not just providing additional access to the SNAP program, but making sure that folks were making good choices with their SNAP benefits. And so we have been aggressively working our SNAP education program uh, to make recipes available to SNAP families so that they understand how they might be able to incorporate fruits and vegetables into their uh, purchasing and into their uh, meal making process and understanding it doesn't necessarily have to be more expensive, uh, that if it's, uh, if it's not fresh, it certainly uh, can and frozen can, can work as well. But we also wanted uh, families, uh, particularly SNAP families, to be able to access uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, which meant we wanted them to participate in what I think is one of the great community building opportunities in America today, which is to go to a farmer's market and participate and shop at a farmer's market. Uh, when I took office and the president took office, uh, there were just a handful of farmer's markets that allowed SNAP families to come to the market and to be, have the technology that would allow them to use their uh, EBT card uh, to purchase fruits and vegetables with their SNAP benefits. Today, over 6,200 additional uh, farmer's markets are now in a position to accept SNAP cards. And with programs like Wholesome Wave and, and a number of other uh, foundations, we're seeing uh, an opportunity to match those SNAP dollars with additional dollars. So SNAP families, uh, seniors, uh, are being encouraged to participate and to purchase more fruits and vegetables. That led Congress, uh, based on our urging to incorporate in the new Farm Bill, a uh, $100 million effort called the Food Insecurity Local Initiative, which is also designed to provide opportunities, particularly for SNAP families, to access organic uh, specialty crop opportunities uh, with their SNAP benefits. And we're in the process of distributing those resources to a wide variety of organizations and entities around the United States to encourage that. Uh, we recognize that we also had a responsibility uh, not just to the children of SNAP families, but also the children in the context of school meals. And so we worked with the First Lady's Office and others to passed the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, and that uh, opportunity in 2010 opened up a new chance for us to expand access to our summer meal or to our school meal program through community eligibility. That's a program that basically says if you're a school district that has 80% or more free and reduced lunch kids, instead of going through the administrative hassle of having kids fill out an application, their parents filling out an application and making sure the youngster brought it back to school and made sure it was processed properly, which oftentimes discouraged people from participating because they were uh, perhaps embarrassed or didn't understand the application or didn't quite understand what this was all about, so they didn't return the application and the youngsters went without. Uh, we now have a process where school districts can treat everyone as a free and reduced lunch kid. United States have now embracing these and are certified as meeting these standards uh, with more fruits and vegetables, more whole grain, more low-fat dairy. We've expanded access to school breakfast, recognizing that working with Share Our Strength and other organizations, we saw the need for youngsters to have school breakfast. A hungry kid is not a kid who's going to learn. Uh, so we've seen a remarkable increase in the participation uh, in school breakfast uh, just with Bill, Billy Shores and the Sierra Strength folks earlier this morning, and he told me that in Los Angeles, for example, now 100% of kids in the Los Angeles School District who participate in school lunch also now participate in school breakfast. That's a positive opportunity for us to make sure we do right by kids and make sure that I fulfill the President's promise. 
Uh, we also uh, looked at ways in which we could provide resources for professional training of uh, food personnel at schools. Uh, so we're in the process of engaging uh, chefs, engaging folks, uh, and encouraging uh, uh, an upgrade uh, of the way in which food is being produced and, and how it's being produced. And $185 million of school equipment grants is providing assistance to schools uh, that are having a hard time figuring out how to produce something on site because they simply don't have the equipment. So now we're in the process of providing the equipment. Uh, the MyPlate uh, effort also is a, a good way of, of sending a very quick uh, and easy message to people in terms of what a healthy plate looks like. We still have an issue in terms of the size of the plate, but um, we're working on that. Bottom line, all of this has resulted in uh, several million fewer kids who are food insecure in this country, uh, about two million fewer kids. We've also moved a number, um, about four million people out of poverty as a result of the SNAP access. Um, and we've seen a plateauing uh, and a slight reduction in obesity rates, so it's headed in the right direction. We need to continue it, which is why it's going to be important for everybody in this room to help us reinforce the message to our friends in Congress of the need to reauthorize the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, to reauthorize our efforts in terms of improved school meals, and not to take a step back when we are uh, forward moving here. We need to take a continued step forward. Um, so that's nutrition, sustainable agriculture, and diversity. Uh, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in focusing on is soil health. Uh, and we have an aggressive effort through our NRCS effort uh, to sort of educate folks about appropriate soil health, recognizing that if we have healthier soil, uh, we're going to have more productivity, and we're also going to have better uh, water resources, and that's going to open up a whole series of opportunities relative to uh, agriculture. So we're focused on cover crops. We're focused on uh, better nutrient management. We're focused on a more appropriate uh, irrigation systems and providing help and assistance and technical assistance and the resources to incorporate uh, the soil health campaign. Uh, a 350 percent increase in cover crops. We're going to continue to see that. Uh, we're now creating risk management tools for cover crops. We're creating new market opportunities uh, for these cover crops, all in a way of encouraging more and more farmers uh, to utilize cover crops. I was on a farm uh, in, in Iowa uh, over the weekend, uh, or last week rather, uh, where they are using uh, cover crops as a conservation uh, practice. Uh, and we're, we're really excited about what we're seeing in terms of preliminary research about the support for and the effect and impact of cover crops. Recognizing that climate is changing, uh, recognizing that farmers need tools, uh, we established a series of climate hubs uh, in seven different locations around the country and three sub hubs. Uh, we challenge those hubs, uh, which are part of our NRCS, our Agricultural Research Service, and the Forest Service, to evaluate the, uh, the, the vulnerabilities of every region of the country relative to agricultural production and, and forestry in terms of changing climate and to provide technologies and techniques and strategies uh, for farmers to be able to adapt and mitigate to the impacts of climate change. Uh, and as part of that effort, we've also challenged our farmers to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, today, uh, farming practices roughly um, uh, absorb, if you will, or sequester the equivalent of 60 million metric tons of greenhouse gas. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture about 9 percent of the overall uh, emissions nationally. Uh, that's less than internationally, 14 percent. Uh, agriculture is responsible for about 14 percent of greenhouse gas emissions internationally. So we are doing a good job. We need to do a better job. Uh, so we have a set of building blocks uh, using our programs to incent better sequestration of carbon, a better understanding of how to use wood, uh, better understanding of, of nutrient management, as I said earlier, rotational grazing, a whole series of things relative to, the, uh, uh, to agriculture which will, I think, make it more sustainable uh, and more diversified. Uh, focused on, obviously, on the pollinator issue, uh, not only are we encouraging crop diversity uh, among our producers, uh, we're actually giving out free seed packets of pollinators, uh, uh, flowers. Uh, if you come to the USDA office uh, and you're a guest of mine, I will be happy to give you uh, a packet of seeds with the understanding that you promised to plant the seeds. Uh, we have 400,000 of those packets, uh, and I actually recently gave one uh, to the Chinese agricultural minister. So we are uh, doing our part uh, to try to make sure that we do a better job uh, of encouraging both uh, uh, bees and, and as well as monarch butterflies. Uh, but we're also using our public lands more effectively uh, in terms of how we use our public lands to produce greater habitat uh, for pollinators, and we are putting more research dollars behind 
understanding the consequences and what steps we can take to improve uh, pollinator health. I know that an issue that you dealt with this morning is antimicrobial resistance, uh, and the USDA is an integral part of the task force that is looking at this issue and taking it very seriously. Uh, we traveled around the country with the FDA to begin the process of educating uh, producers about the judicious use of antibiotics, the use of it only in the terms of, of the health of an animal, as opposed to uh, at what it has been used in the past as a, as a growth promotion uh, technique. We're moving away from that, uh, and I think that's a positive thing. We're also uh, putting a, a substantial amount of research behind the, the mechanics, if you will, of antimicrobial resistance. We want to learn more about how it happens, where it happens, why it happens, uh, so that we're in a position to be able to do a better job of dealing with it uh, and also looking at the impact of, of probiotics. Uh, water is an issue that we're focused on in a very big way. Uh, we are uh, currently focusing a lot of our efforts in California as we deal with drought, trying to figure out how to use water more efficiently and more effectively. Uh, I often say that my favorite uh, a project that we recently funded was how to capture fog more effectively. Uh, who knew that you could actually capture fog, much less make it more effectively? Uh, but apparently the coating of the, the uh, contraption that captures the fog, uh, we've developed a new coating system that basically creates larger droplets uh, of fog, and that then is used to, to provide some uh, moisture for, uh, for crops. Um, we have a, a very significant int uh, interest in food waste. Uh, if we want to be more sustainable, one way we can be more sustainable is to reduce the fact that a third of our food in this country is wasted. Roughly 30 percent internationally of food is wasted. In a developing country, it's because of portion sizes. It's because of not understanding what sell-by dates mean. It's a, a result of not recycling and reusing more efficiently. In developing countries, it's really about storage and about uh, better understanding of how to, uh, how to prepare food. Uh, in any event, we are engaged with now over 4,000 partners. We've challenged the country to reduce uh, food waste by half in the next 15 to 20 years, uh, and we would encourage you to look at our USDA.gov website uh, to see what we're doing relative to, uh, to food waste. All of this is part of an effort to try to take, make agriculture, uh, in a sense, more sustainable, more diverse. That means not just diversity in terms of crop selection and crop methods, but also in terms of the size of operations. And, and let me just briefly talk about our support for local and regional food systems, which we see as not only in a positive thing in terms of creating more options relative to farming, but we also see it as a, re a rural development, economic development driver uh, in rural America. Um, and so we have had an aggressive, comprehensive, coordinated effort to try to support local and regional food systems. It started with the establishment of a microloan program that didn't exist before this administration. In the past, we would provide loans to farmers who were very, very experienced. Uh, they would be ownership or operating loans. They'd be several hundred thousand dollars. They would obviously be designed for larger uh, operations. Uh, we created a microloan program. It's a loan of up to $50,000. It's a seven-year repayment. The interest rate is substantially lower than what you would get at a bank. Uh, the experience requirements are very minimal. Uh, the application process is substantially smaller and less uh, cumbersome than our overall uh, traditional program. We've had over 14,000 of those microloans, uh, and it's obviously a very popular aspect. Uh, Congress thought it was such a good idea that they incorporated it in the Farm Bill uh, and raised the threshold from $35,000 to $50,000. So it's something that I think is helpful uh, to get people into the business. Uh, there was mention at the last panel about the uh, beginning farmer and de uh, rancher development program. I suspect, I don't know this, but I suspect that virtually every one of the programs that was mentioned on this platform was probably funded in part or in whole by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We have a very aggressive effort in beginning farmers and ranchers to give folks the understanding not just of the mechanics of agriculture but the business aspect of it. That's extremely important. We've looked for ways to extend the growing season, particularly for specialty crops, uh, in uh, climates that may not be particularly conducive to that. So we've uh, financed over 14,000 tunnel houses or hoop houses, uh, which are very popular uh, with specialty crop producers. We've looked for ways to expand market access to those specialty crops and those, for those smaller sized operators. We've expanded our support for farmers markets. We've helped to food hubs aggregate locally produced and regionally produced food uh, to be able to process and market it more effectively. We financed over a thousand projects in that space. We've done a, a very aggressive effort in farm to school. Uh, we've reached 221 school districts in the country uh, with a grant program that's now impacting six and a half million children. 
uh, where they are purchasing uh, roughly $600 million of locally produced product. We think this is a $3 billion uh, opportunity, so we're going to continue, obviously, to survey and to encourage uh, farm to school. And we know from a recent survey and study that it provides healthier choices and less food waste in the school meal program. Uh, so it's, a, it's an important opportunity. All told, we've invested roughly $800 million uh, over the last four or five years in our Know Your Farmer initiative, uh, and we're going to continue to do that because we know it's uh, the right thing to do. We've also increased significantly our specialty crop research initiative, and we have created for the first time an organic research initiative, several hundred million dollars in those two research initiatives. Uh, first time ever that there was a specific carve out for organic. Uh, we've expanded crop insurance. Uh, one of the complaints that I heard about specialty crop producers and organic folks was that we didn't, they didn't have the same kind of risk management tools that commodity producers had. That's changing. 73 crops now covered by crop insurance that weren't covered before. And our organic, we changed the way in which they would compensate organic producers for losses. In the past, an organic producer, unfortunately, received from crop insurance the same amount as if their product was a commodity-priced product. Obviously, everybody knows that organic is a much more high value added proposition. And the result is we now have an opportunity for uh, producers to purchase a uh, insurance product that is priced based on the contract price that they have for their product. So they actually get the value uh, of what it is that they uh, grow if they're unfortunately confronted with a weather circumstance or situation where they weren't able to produce a crop. We dedicated conservation funding for organic producers. $115 million has been allocated in that program. We've created directories in terms of expanded farmers markets and the location of them, community supported agricultural activities, uh, as well as food hubs. And we're now providing uh, data and information on pricing of specialty crops and organic crops so that individual farmers and the local and regional food system will be able to price more effectively their product. We like this opportunity because if we have smaller size producers participating in a commodity-based uh, system, they are at a severe disadvantage. Commodity-based systems are based on technology and size and productivity and, and uh, a, a sort of a similar quality. Uh, it really gives a, a local and regional food system, gives the ability of the 162,000 producers that are now engaged in this, of the opportunity to directly negotiate a price with their customer. Uh, they can size it, they can price it based on their needs and based on what can be uh, sustainable in terms of their business plan. And that they, for that, they need to have some sense of what it is the market's currently bearing. We're now providing pricing information on a wide variety of organic and specialty crop products. We're going to launch uh, very soon an urban farming toolkit. Uh, this uh, opportunity for diversity means that uh, not just locating these farms in rural areas, but also making sure that urban farming opportunities are being created. Uh, the situation in Ferguson, the situation in Baltimore, uh, led us to believe that there's an opportunity to rebuild community through agriculture in urban centers. But again, we need to make it easier for people to understand how to get started. Uh, so we took a look at uh, what folks like Will Allen and others have done, uh, tried to figure out how you might provide a sort of a checklist and a, a resource and a reference list uh, for those who want to get started in an urban setting. Uh, and we're going to be launching that toolkit very, very soon. We're also looking at uh, capital financing. We established a mechanism called a rural business investment company, which is now making investments in companies that are helping small and regional sized producers. Uh, recently, an investment was made to an outfit in, uh, in uh, Iowa uh, to establish and to support cage-free uh, poultry production. Uh, we've looked at trade expansion for the organic market to make it easier for us to export and for us uh, for those uh, uh, who are interested in organic uh, product products to be able to import. We now have equivalency agreements with South Korea, Japan, Canada, and the EU, and Switzerland that didn't exist before, and we're negotiating with Mexico. And finally, in this space, we are definitely focused on encouraging uh, a broad array of people to get into the farming business. Uh, so there's a concerted effort by Deputy Secretary Hardin and the USDA to encourage women, people of color, and veterans to get in the farming business, a particular focus on veterans that wasn't mentioned earlier today. Uh, you know, the reality is a lot of these uh, folks who come back from war-torn uh, areas have a difficult time readjusting back into uh, regular life, if you will. And we have found that when you are, are give them the opportunity to nurture and to grow, uh, it's therapeutic for them. Uh, and so we are working with a number of organizations to try to make sure that veterans have this opportunity. And we're actually now, for the first time, going to be able to go on base before individuals are, are, are leave the military 
to give them an opportunity to understand the opportunities that exist within agriculture. So all of this is designed uh, to suggest that change is happening. Uh, we are improving access to our, 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 our programs. We're improving uh, the quality of the meals being served to our children. We're encouraging uh, families that are struggling financially to have the same opportunities that the rest of us have. We're uh, trying to promote diversity within agriculture, and we are very, very much supportive of local and regional food systems. Let me just end, uh, and then I'll be happy to take questions. Two things. One, we need your help to sustain the progress that's un undertaken. Understand that you'd like us to do more, and no doubt there will be more done. Uh, but the reality is that we are dealing in a political environment that isn't necessarily conducive uh, to a lot of what we've done. Uh, so it is going to be important uh, for people to continue to be engaged, to continue to be vocal, to continue to press uh, and push forward. Uh, but recognize and appreciate, I hope, uh, that your work is making a difference, that change is occurring, uh, and it's going to continue to occur because it's the right thing to do. Secondly, I hope that folks would understand uh, the situation of the American farmer. And I don't expect you necessarily to be totally sympathetic, but I want you to know who these people are. You know, for the most part, um, there are about 2.2, 2.3 million people that are characterized or qualify as farmers under our survey at USDA. It only takes uh, the ability to raise about $1,000 of product for sale to be a quote unquote farmer. About 1.3 million of that 2.2, 2.3 million are folks who are doing something in the back of their home out in a rural area. Uh, they may be growing some strawberries. They may be uh, growing some apples that they turn into cider, and every year they take it down to the farmer's market, and for a couple months they sell a couple thousand bucks worth of stuff, and, and it's a good thing that, that that's t taking place. But they're not making any money off this. They're just doing it because they enjoy doing it. So that leaves about a million people uh, that we uh, if you went out and talked to the person on the street, would ask, you know, you know, define for me a family farmer. That's probably, they're probably talking about these people that do farming, if you will, for a living. Of that number, about 700,000 of that number are small to medium-sized operators uh, who sell less than $250,000 worth of product. In the best times we've had in agriculture, in the last six or seven years, record exports, uh, in some, uh, in some day, a year's record income. These folks averaged about $10,000 from their farming operation. $10,000. Which means that the vast majority of that six, 700,000 folks, they are working on the farm, they're working off the farm, and their spouse is working on the farm and off the farm. They struggle, but they love the land, they're connected to the land, and they want to stay in the land, and we want to help them. And then you've got the other two to 300,000 that are commercial-sized operations, and you know they're doing pretty well. But all of those people feel today that what they do is not fully appreciated or recognized. They feel that uh, you know they're out there doing their best. They, they, they think they're doing what's right for conservation. They think they care about the soil, and they do. They, they are, are caring about the water. Uh, they're caring about their neighbors. They're producing food and they're proud of it. And they think it's nice that we produce more food in this country than we need so we're able to export and create jobs as a result and provide food assistance to uh, folks who are struggling uh, internationally. They're proud of what they do. And then they also live in a place in America where they represent a small percentage of America's population and a smaller, ever smaller percentage. Now 15% of America's population lives in rural areas. But yet they contribute about 40% of our military. So their sons and daughters go off to these dangerous places and have for the last decade or so and put their lives at risk for their country. They just want to be appreciated. They just want to be understood. They just want to have folks understand and appreciate that we have this pretty good deal here in this country where we are food secure, where we're able to meet all of our needs from a food standpoint based on what we grow and what we raise. And that's unlike most any other great nation in the, in the world today. Uh, that we pay, you know, maybe less than what we should for, for our food, but we certainly uh, benefit, if you will, from having some flexibility with our paycheck. And that they uh, send their sons and daughters in the service of the country in greater percentages. So I hope that as we have this discussion about food, 
that we have it as an inclusive discussion, as a discussion that understands the economic challenges of everybody in farming, and who, where there's an expression maybe of you ought to be doing it a little differently, you ought to be thinking about something, but there's an overall understanding and appreciation for what farmers do. Because we're blessed. Every single one of us who's not a farmer is able to be not a farmer because we've delegated the responsibility to somebody else to feed our family. And I, these are good people, they're hardworking people, um, and they deserve a, a level of appreciation that sometimes they don't think as they listen to the concerns that they get. In fact, and I, I was at a, a function in Iowa. I did a, an interview for RFD TV. And the president of the Iowa Farm Bureau came up to me afterwards. And the guy, he got all choked up. And he said, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you acknowledge what we're doing. We just don't think other folks outside of agriculture really appreciate what we're doing. So I'm here today to tell you change is happening. It's a good thing. It's supportive of lots of what you all want us to do. There are probably things where we may disagree and, and maybe the pace of change is not what you want it to be. But I hope we can create an opportunity for food to be a unifying discussion in this country, not a divisive one. So with that, I'll stop and uh, take your questions. I, I think we have time for just a few questions. Um, looks like someone, if we, if we don't mind bringing a microphone. No idea why they always put the Secretary of Agriculture before the meal. <laughs> <laughs> People really appreciate the, the lunch. Thank you for being here. I wonder if you can talk to us about the next 15 months. I'm curious what's on your to-do list around the environment, health, social, and racial justice, uh, specifically, like what you want to check off that list, and then what we as advocates can do to help you get those things across the finish line. And maybe if you could also give us some tips about looking at the next administration and how advocates can <laughs> Protect some of the things we've won and maybe move some other things forward. Wow, okay. Um, <laughs> maybe make plans for dinner. But. <laughs> Next 15 months, first of all, let me point out that I serve at the pleasure of one guy. So if he's not happy today, I could be out of a job tomorrow. So I'll, I'll talk about the administration's goals here. Um, we clearly have to have the nutrition programs reauthorized. Uh, and we have to have them reauthorized in a way that protects the gains we've made. We do not want to take a step back to the days of more fat and more sugar and more sodium and less fruits and vegetables. I mean, we don't want to necessarily cater to the very small percentage of, of schools that are having a hard time with this and their concerns to basically scrap the standards or to create more flexibility so they don't have to follow the standards. A better way is to help them get to the standards and we're trying to do that through our Team Up for Success program where we're mentoring struggling schools with succeeding schools that are similarly situated. So that's first and foremost from my perspective on the nutrition side. On the sustainable agriculture side, you know, there, there are a lot of things that need to be done. Uh, we need to continue to aggressively uh, focus on this issue of antimicrobial resistance and have a better understanding from a research and data perspective exactly the, 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 the biology of all of this so that we understand what needs to happen on the farm, what needs to happen in the processing facilities, uh, to order, in order to us to minimize uh, uh, the utilization uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, antibiotics and, and also to figure out alternatives to antibiotics so that over time we transition uh, to, a, to a better place in that, in that respect. We need to continue to focus on expanded pollinator uh, habitat. Um, we need to promote conservation and have an understanding of the potential for conservation this isn't just about, as important as this is, soil quality and water health. That's really important. But it's also an economic opportunity to create what are called ecosystem markets. Whether it's habitat and species development or water quality or water quantity or carbon sequestration, they're tremendous opportunities for us if we can measure and quantify conservation results to market those results to regulated industries. We want to further that. Uh, we want Chevrolet, which recently uh, purchase carbon credits on a working ranch in North Dakota. We want more opportunities like that. We want more partnerships like the one we have with Coca-Cola where they're trying to reclaim the water that they use in the production of their products uh, by investing in conservation. We want to further that and we also want to do it on our force. Uh, we want to create excitement around uh, the notion of 
plant-based materials. You know, most of what we're sitting on and standing and leaning against are, are petroleum-based because that's the way our economy was built years ago. Well, we now have the capacity to basically everything in this room could be plant-based materials, chemicals, fibers, fabrics, fuel, uh, energy from uh, crop residue, from uh, animal waste, from perennial grasses, from woody biomass. Let's replicate nature and not have waste. Let's figure out how to do something higher value added, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, uh, and create a new manufacturing opportunity that could exist. An example is uh, uh, the, the Navy is currently uh, wanting to have half of their fuel being, bio, be, being domestically produced plant-based. So we have an algae facility, we've got a municipal waste facility, and I think we have perennial grass or woody biomass facility that's producing a drop-in aviation fuel from municipal waste, landfill waste, from agricultural waste, and from uh, woody biomass or perennial grasses. That's a great opportunity. And if you think about it, then commercial aviation could also use that to meet their international emission requirements. So we want to further those kinds of creative opportunities. We want to make sure that we continue to invest in ag research. You know, frankly, we have uh, sort of flatlined our commitment to agricultural research and, and publicly financed research, which I think is important uh, because publicly financed research, research with our open data initiative in this administration is going to be available to everybody. You're not going to have to pay for it. It's just going to be there, and you can figure out how to use it. Uh, I think we need to do more of that. I, I mentioned that we've established a foundation uh, that is going to look at photosynthesis. Uh, you know, I studied that a long time ago. I thought it was a relatively simple proposition, but apparently it's not. Uh, and these folks are thinking about how can you pr create energy and electricity from plants. You know, you're linking a potato to a, a light, and uh, they, apparently photosynthesis will allow you to light the light with a potato. That sounds way out, but you know, if you're looking at renewable energy, which we are, sounds pretty interesting and may create another income opportunity for that small and mid-sized operator so they can stay in business and not necessarily have to work always off the farm. So there, th th there are those kinds of opportunities in rural development. There are some big issues that we're not going to be able to solve in 15 years, but we got to set them up for the next administration. And one of the big issues, which wasn't really discussed here earlier today, is land tenure. It's all well and good to say to women, hey, get into farming business. All well and good for us to say to people of color, you should be part of this. All well and good for us to say to veterans, hey, get into farming business, it's great for you. There's no access to land. Uh, and the reality is that a lot of the land ownership is owned by older folks. What are they going to do with that land? And what's happening is a lot of farm families, the kids are moving off the farm to the city. They're going to own the farm. But what is their interest in owning the farm? Is it income? Or is it a willingness to invest some of that income in conservation? And how can we make sure that those succeeding generations are just as interested in conservation as their mom and dad was? Or how can we create alternatives and opportunities for that land to be available to beginning farmers? Here's a suggestion. The conversation is almost always in the context, if I go to a Farm Bureau or if I go to National Farmers Union, I, I go, it's always about the estate tax. Nobody, nobody pays the estate tax in farming, really. I mean, there are a handful of folks who pay the estate tax, but for the most part, if you do planning, you can avoid the estate tax. It's not the issue. The issue is the income tax. Because you have a situation where people have owned land for a long period of time, it's evaluated, it's increased in value, and there's no incentive whatsoever for them to sell the land or make it available to a beginning farmer. Why? Because if they sell it, they pay capital gains tax. If they die owning it, they get a stepped up basis to the fair market value as of the date they die, and their heirs can sell it the following day and pay no income tax. So if we're really interested in getting young people into the business, we ought to be thinking about ways in which we could use potentially the tax system to encourage people like myself and my wife, we own a farm, our two boys are not going to farm, to think about the possibility of making that available uh, to a beginning farmer. And also to look at the public land that we own the land around military bases, the land that we own uh, in concert with land-grant universities, and put a stipulation on it that it's not the highest and best value that we necessarily want to get out of that public land, but maybe the highest and best use, which might be making it available to beginning farmers. We started that process today, as a matter of fact. Uh, Florida and A&M is receiving 3,200 acres of land from us. We, sh we closed an ARS lab down there, and that 3,200 uh, acres is going to Florida and A&M. They're not paying for it. 
with the stipulation that they create a beginning farmer and rancher opportunity on that 32 acres. That's an example of what could be done. Last, uh, future administrations, you know, the snarky answer is to elect the right people. <laughs> I'll let you figure out who that is. But I would say this about my party as a Democrat. We make a mistake not speaking to rural folks. We make a mistake not recognizing them, not appreciating them, and not speaking to them. We speak about them a lot. We speak uh, critically about them from time to time. We don't speak to them. And if we're really interested in having a cohesive, comprehensive approach, while well, executive action is great, we couldn't do the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act by executive action. We needed a Congress passing it and a president to implement it. You're not going to have a Congress to pass it unless Democrats speak to rural voters to be able to express to them an appreciation for what they do so that they are open to the Democratic message. And Republicans need to learn how to speak to people of color and to recently uh, arriving Americans in a way that opens up that possibility for their party so that we essentially get some cohesiveness in, 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 in government. And until that happens, we're going to continue to have this split personality we've got. Uh, and you all are going to continue to be frustrated by the fact that it doesn't appear as if something's going on. Actually, there's a lot going on, but not as much as could. We need immigration reform, no question about that. That's not going to happen unless we have some co co coordinated effort within the executive branch and the, and the, and the, and the legislative branch. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much. We right. really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic speech.